Hi, I'm Gene Schriefer. I'm an educator with the University of Wisconsin-Madison Division of Extension. And uh, today we are actually in the barn uh, at, at our farm uh, here in the Driftless region, uh, talking about grazing management and livestock calculations and how we can uh, use those types of things and why they're important in, in helping people develop their grazing plans. Management itself implies an ability to measure things, you know, how much of something and if we change management, how does that management impact uh, what we can measure. The other part of management is the ability to control. So grazing management, uh, we can control livestock, we can control area, we can control forage, and we can measure all of those things. And, and the measuring is, is really essential to good grazing planning. So what do we know? We know how many cows we have or sheep or goats or whatever it is that we're grazing. Probably have a pretty good idea on what each of those animals weigh or what the average weight of that group is. And based on those two things, we can estimate the amount of forage uh, that's going to be required to feed that group for one day, two day, three days. Now, certainly we're going to see some changes in consumption based on stage of production. We know lactating animals need more forage, more energy than non-lactating animals. And, and we also know that uh, the digestibility of the forage is going to impact intake. So highly digestible forage, they can eat more, they can process it faster. We get better milk, better rates of gain doing that. So those are all pretty basic math, uh, but we have to sit down and make those calculations. Let's think about some of those livestock calculations just as a, a quick example. And well, let's, let's assume we've got a 1,200 pound dry beef cow and our best estimate is she's going to consume about 2% of her body weight per day on a dry matter basis. No, we're not measuring wet forage, we want dry matter. So that means that cow is gonna consume something around 24 pounds of dry matter per day. So we know we need 24 pounds of dry matter. We have 100 cow herd, they're all about that same uh, weight, all dry. We need to budget about 2,400 pounds a day or a little bit over a ton and a quarter uh, to supply that feed in that pasture for one day. If we have three days in that pasture, then we need three times 2,400 or 7,200 pounds. So about three and a half tons uh, of forage to, to feed that single group of animal for that time period. Now our job then is to say, I've got this many pounds per acre or tons per acre. It needs to be one acre, two acres, three acres. So in my, my example earlier, we, we used 2% of body weight for a dry cow. Within our CS, we, we tend to use a little bit higher number. We use a 4% level to cover all different classes of animals. It's a little bit more conservative, but it makes sure that we don't run out of grass. We're calculating in there a little bit of trampling losses and a little bit more for, for residual. And I'd rather have too few cattle than too many. So the easiest way to make money in farming is never run out of money and never run out of grass. Uh, be a little bit conservative, especially as you're starting out. As you get better in understanding the management part of it, then we can start adjusting our livestock numbers upwards. The other thing that we need to be able to measure and estimate is the amount of forage that we have available. And if we can measure that forage and measure that forage over time, it enables us to make those types of management decisions that are going to improve our grazing operation itself. So for instance, uh, you know, we, we want to know how quickly a pasture is, is regrowing after we've grazed it down. So a target for a grazer might be something in the eight to 10 inches of, of grass growth and we're gonna graze that down to four or five inches. And if we're staying on a 30 day rotation, we need to get about an inch, a little bit over an inch of growth per week in that example for that to be ready in 30 days. Now, if we see that after a week, we've got less than an inch, we're gonna to have to figure out how to slow that rotation down. So if we're measuring our rate of growth and we're expecting something around an inch and we're getting an inch and a half or two inches and we start to see that pattern over 
two, three, four weeks of, of, of regrowth periods, we'll find ourselves with a, a surplus situation. We're growing more grass at a rate faster than what our groups of livestock are able to consume it. In that case, uh, certain times of the year, perhaps we would think about harvesting some of that ex excess uh, forage mechanically for stored feeds for other times of the year. Likewise, if it's not regrowing adequately, we need to figure out how to slow it down. We can add in more paddocks. We can take uh, reduce pressure on the paddock as far as reducing numbers. Maybe we have to add a little bit of supplemental feed. But the sooner we're able to realize that those changes are occurring, the faster we can adjust our grazing management in order to make those types of, of, of corrections. The other role that we have in, in measuring uh, our grass and, and how much grass is available is making some critical decisions. Uh, and the most critical are, are two times of the year. One is when should we start grazing in the spring? You know, there, just because it's green and there's grass, should we turn the cows loose or, or should we wait for a period of time? Likewise, in the fall, things are winding down. Uh, should we just keep grazing because there's grass out there or, or should we stop that grazing? So what we know from research uh, is that in grazing, one thing leads to another. So what we do in spring can impact our regrowth going into summer. What we do in summer can impact our grass growth going into fall. And fall, even though things are winding down, already starts to set us up for that following spring. When we wait for a period of time for that grass to grow in the spring, we have more total seasonal production. So we don't want to wait till it's 10 inches tall, but we don't want to start when it's a half inch tall and, and green. We need to find that moderate spot such that we can start grazing, we can start to get our residual growth going. And then at the end of the year, we want to leave four uh, inches, three or four inches behind, especially on cool season grasses, because that plant has already produced dormant buds for next spring. And when we take that all the way down, graze it down to the, I call it just a putting green, you know, short, uh, no, no grass residual out there, that can delay spring grain up one, two, or more weeks the following year. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm tired of feeding hay by April or May, and I think my cattle and my sheep are tired of eating it. They'd really like to have grass. It's our cheapest way of feed livestock. The more days and the sooner we can get on good grass growing, the better I think we're doing financially. So it's, it's a good thing. We want to stop in the fall when we've got residual and we can measure that residual. And we want to wait in the spring until we've got enough grass growth out there uh, that we can cons sustain a uh, very rapid regrowth period. As I've worked with grazers over the last 20 years, one of the hardest lessons to really learn or unlearn if you've been grazing most of your career is this concept of residual. You know, we, we think of it as wasted grass if we haven't had let the livestock consume it, but it's not. This is the solar panel. This is the solar collector that enables that plant to regrow quicker, allows it to grow faster, and it's helping build soil uh, below ground by not taking that down. When we can keep that residual intact, even if it's in July and August and we're running out of regrowth, we have to protect that because every drought ends with a rain. And if we've got that residual intact and it rains and we can capture that water, we'll quickly have more grass to grow than if we had taken that residual down. So it begins with measuring, monitoring our grass growth rate, and tracking that over time. As you start out, we spend more time and effort in, in doing those types of activities. And we talk about developing that grass eye. Do I do that as much now after 30 or 40 years of grazing as I used to do? No, because I've gotten very good uh, at estimating how much grass is out there and what that growth rate is. So how do we go about uh, measuring the amount of forage that's out there? I mean, there's, there's lots of different ways that we can do it. Uh, it does, can be complicated. It can be simple. It depends on, you know, how engaged you or, or your, your clients uh, become with, with measuring their pasture forage. 
There's electronic digital meters that read electric, uh, electrical resistance in the forge and they can estimate forge based on that. It's all calibrated. There's rising plate meters that take a little bit of calibration. So most likely a lot of us have something pretty simple laying around the house. A, a, a basic yardstick uh, can work uh, quite well. Uh, other times we have pasture sticks, uh, which are really handy for estimating some different factors that we're not really gonna cover today. Uh, but if we took a, a simple yardstick and walk randomly across our, our pasture, you know, we can put that in every 20, 30 paces. We'll read each of those numbers. What's the bottom number that below what we can read, add those numbers up, divide by the number of spots that we've measured, and we can get an idea on the height of our grass. And we can actually use that number to estimate about how much forage is available out there and or the regrowth rate. So the first time we try to measure pasture forage, if we're doing it ourselves using a yardstick or a pasture stick, it's going to take a little time. First time we do anything, uh, it's, it's a long drawn out process. I'm not even going to tell you how long it took me to shear my very first sheep 30 years ago. But with practice and experience, we get very good at it. Lots of resources are available to help you with this. NRCS has a lot of documentation on how to calculate pasture yields, how to measure those things. We can go online, find YouTube videos on how to use a rising plate meter, how to build your own rising plate meter, if that's what you'd like to do. And then technology is really coming quite a, quite a ways as far as these electronic pasture probes and other ways of, of quickly and efficiently and accurately measuring pasture yields and pasture growth that's out there. So learning process, but it gets better, it gets easier, but we have to go through that to, to get better. So it all starts with management, and management begins with being able to measure. And that's a key to livestock grazing planning.